was noticing, hey, we're running out of seats a little bit, so start filling those up. We'll start looking for another place to meet. Amen. Amen. All right, Hebrews 11, he already read uh, the first 20 verses, but let's look again at verse 5 and 6. Here's where we're uh, focusing on this morning. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Isn't that a good testimony that we all want to have? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Look over at Genesis 5. Here's the main story that we get from the life of Enoch. And it's not very long. And I don't know if you're like me, but you know, I, when I think of Enoch... Traditionally, my thoughts just always thought of this mysterious guy that just popped up on the scene and then he's gone. But actually, if you look at this, he lived 365 years. And the Bible doesn't say a lot about him, but uh, where was I? Genesis chapter 5. And if you look at verse 21, it introduces him. Well, he was introduced earlier, but 21 talks about him. Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. How'd you like to be 65 years old and, and have a child? <laughs> but uh, obviously he lived to be 365 years. So uh, here's what he says. Then he walked with God. Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. And I don't know if he was walking with God before he had Methuselah or what, but it almost seems like this is where he had this, uh, this time where he started walking with God. And then it says that uh, uh, he's 300 years. Let me see here. Uh, Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And so it says that he walked with God, and in Hebrews it said he had this testimony that he pleased God. So how do we please God? Walking with God. It seems like those are synonymous. Walking with God, pleasing God, and that's the testimony that we want to have is, is being men and women who walk with God. And Enoch is a great example, even though he's not mentioned a whole lot of times in the Bible, he's a great example of a guy who pleased God. He's a guy who over, you know, for at least 300 years of his life, walked with God all the way up into the very end. And we see that uh, his faith, if you continue reading in chapter 5, get into chapter 6, you see that it was his lineage that kind of brings in uh, Noah. So I don't know the whole story, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And it seems like probably Enoch's walk with God had an impact on his future generations. That's what I would, uh, would assume. So Enoch was a good example of someone who lives by faith. But here's something that a lot of people might not realize. He's also a great example in the Bible of a preacher. Look at, chapter, uh, look at Jude. He said, what did he do while he was walking with God for 300 plus years? Well, apparently he preached, and I find this amazing, all right? Genesis 5, beginning of the Bible. Now we're at Jude, the end of the Bible. And what was it that he prophesied? Look at verse 14, Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, talking about this list of men that he was just talking about. And he prophesied, saying, behold... The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all, I love this verse, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. So I'm like almost you can get a message out of that verse <laughs> and uh, if you're a preacher. But man, he's a good example of someone who preached. You know, he prophesied. Uh, something that was yet to be seen. He preached hard. He didn't tolerate ungodliness and all that. He was a good example of somebody who was a preacher. And here's another thing is he's a good example of raptured saints. You say, raptured saints? What do you mean? Well, here's a guy that just walked with God and then all of a sudden he was not. And actually a lot of people use that, use him as a picture of the rapture. And so... I didn't intend for it to be this way, but this, in this message, we're going to deal with a lot of uh, kind of end times, prof, prophetic type things. And so we're going to look at that. And first of all, 
what I have heard growing up, and maybe some of y'all have too, is that Enoch's walking with God, and then he was not, was a picture of the church. Anybody ever heard that? And so Enoch was gone, and then right after that, uh, Noah, you see him in the ark, and those, so they said, say, hey, look, all the Christians are going to be raptured out of here, and then comes the tribulation, and then they're in the ark. And really, I heard that my whole life, and there's a lot of points on that whole lineup that don't, uh, they don't really line up with the scriptures, but I, I do believe that Enoch is a good picture of, somebody, of the rapture, which I'm going to talk about a little bit this morning, okay? But not uh, actually a picture of the pre-trib uh, rapture that, I, was, that I, grown, I grew up learning, but here's an interesting thing. We just read from Jude 14, verse 14 and 15, and here was the prophecy that he made back in Genesis 5. Here was the prophecy he made. He said that, Behold, uh, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. Okay, He cometh with ten thousands of his saints. You say, how does he do that? Who's this army God's bringing with him? What is, what's going on in that, in that story? Now, let's compare that to the 144,000 in Revelation 7. Revelation 7. A little deep for a Sunday morning, but we can, we can get through this. Revelation chapter 7. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel dis, uh, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth, uh, given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then you're familiar, I'm sure, with this next section where he goes through and he lists that, that this, is, this group is made up of, of uh, 12,000 of each tribe, right, to equal 144 Thousand Each tribe of Israel, he goes through all of that. And then verse 9 there, he says, And this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues uh, stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with robes and palms in their hand. And so throughout the history of the, uh, of, of the church and people trying to exposit the Bible and try to figure out these dark, uh, hidden secrets, I guess, in the Bible, which really, come to find out, aren't so hidden. <laughs> I mean, we have a book of the Bible called Revelation. God wanted to reveal it to us, and He shows it to us. They're really not that hidden. But, uh, but whenever you get to this point and you read this, uh, He introduces this 144,000 that seems mysterious. And then right after, he mentions a multitude that's, great, that's greater than what you can number. Now, let me ask you this. It would be hard, but could you number tens of thousands of people? Could you number 144,000? Obviously, he did, uh, because he mentions them in this section. So, uh, I, th I find that interesting that Job's, I mean, not Job, Jude uh, talks about Enoch prophesying that tens of thousands of people are coming with the Lord. Now, if he said hundreds of thousands, it couldn't be the 144,000 because hundreds of thousands would mean at least 200,000, right? So it could be hundreds of thousands. So he uses the next highest increment of measurement and says tens of thousands, right? 144,000 would be tens of thousands. So he comes back, the Lord comes, and he's got this 144,000 with him, and then he sees multitude, great multitudes of people in heaven. We just read that. Now look at Revelation 13. This is coming back to the vision of the 144,000. And uh, uh, actually 14, I'm sorry. Revelation 14. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on, on the Mount Sion, and with him 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of, the great, of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 440 and 4,000 that were redeemed from the earth. 
That's an interesting phrase, redeemed from the earth. What's that mean? Well, well, I was always taught, who are these 144,000? Well, they're just 12, you know, 12,000 people from each tribe of Israel. Well, I thought that we don't know that there are any tribes in Israel right now. Well, yeah, we don't, but, but this is what I was always told, but God knows where they are, right? And I always kind of blew my mind, like, how are you going to get 12, not just 12,000 from every tribe, every tribe that is non-existent really anymore, and how are you going to get 12,000 from each one of them? But wait, they're not, just, they're not just people, they're not just Jews, they're young virgin males. So you've got to get 12,000 from each tribe of these guys. Who is this? And then what does it mean they were redeemed from the earth? Well, I believe uh, that the Bible shows us that what it means by redeemed by, uh, from the earth, you go back to Ezekiel 37 where it talks about the valley of the dry bones, and we're literally talking about people who come up from the grave. So what are you talking about? Coming up from the grave? That's kind of freaky. That was like a zombie movie or something like that. But no, this is who we're talking about. They come up from the grave. And so I'll give a little bit of a background about Enoch, because this is what our text is talking about. Enoch, he's an example of living by faith. He's an example of a preacher, and he's also an example of raptured saints, okay? But here's what the focus of the message is, and I already tried to kind of give a little bit of an introduction. The focus of the message uh, this morning is this, ways to get there. I'm talking about heaven, okay? Ways to get to heaven. Now we know there's only one way to get to heaven spiritually, right? <laughs> Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So spiritually, to get to uh, heaven, we understand there's only one way. But you know, physically, there are a few different ways that these bodies that we live in right now are going to get to heaven. There's a few different ways. And first one is this I want to mention. Look at Revelation 20. The first way that the majority of people are going to get to heaven and all the Old Testament saints, all the way from, you know, uh, uh, Genesis that we already read all the way up to this time we're talking about is most people are going to die. And after they die, they're waiting for the resurrection. And in the resurrection, they will, their bodies will actually be resurrected. Uh, so Revelation 20 is one of the clear places where we get this teaching where it literally uses the word first, uh, first uh, uh, resurrection. Look at Revelation 20, verse 5. But this is talking about after the millennium, all right? If you read the context before that, it makes it clear. After the thousand-year reign of Christ. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. All those that he, all the resurrection he's talking about, right, up before this time. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, uh, Satan shall be loosed out of, out of prison and shall go to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And uh, they went up on the breadth of the, breadth of the earth and compassed the, uh, the camp of the saints about and uh, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, this is all stuff that happens, obviously, after uh, the millennium now, okay? We're talking about a battle that happens after the millennium. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire, verse 10, a fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there were found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book, and life, uh, book of life according, I'm sorry, written in the books according to their works, okay? So what we have here are the dead standing before God to be judged. Who are these dead? Well, if you go back up there to the beginning, what I read, it said, the rest of the dead live not until after the thousand years. Well, that's the dead that stands before God in the final judgment. And they're judged out of the books. And I believe the books is referring to the Bible. And the laws that we find in the Bibles, that's what they're judged according to. Now, you know as well as I do, 90% of the doors we knocked were somebody even that claims to be a Christian, and we ask them about if they know for sure they're going to heaven when they die, and they'll put work, all about works. 
they'll say, well, yeah. Oh, some of them even say, I'm 100% sure. And you say, well, how do you know? Well, I live a pretty good life. I'm like, that's not 100% sure. <laughs> and really, that's, that's pretty presumptuous that you might think that you could get to heaven because of your good works, right? If that was the case, I would have to be like another big percentage of people we talk to that say, yeah, I just don't think anybody could know for sure, right? That's what I would have to rely on for my whole life if I was relying on my works. Like, I hope so. When I get to before God, I'm going to, you know, my works are going to be put on a scale. That's what I thought when I was a little kid before I understood uh, what salvation was. And this is what a lot of people think. And then one day they're going to stand before God, and we read it in Matthew 7. They're going to say, Lord, Lord, but I did this in your name and that in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Your name's not in the book. All right. So the second judgment, whenever they stand before God, has nothing to do, right, because they're all, they're all, uh, going to go, they're all, death and hell is going to be cast to the lake of fire, which is the second death. All right, so they're raised again, judged according to the works, <laughs> then they're eternally, eternally uh, punished. Okay, so that's the first, uh, that's, the, that's the, talking about the second one. But anyway, so the first way that we uh, can get, our bodies will get to heaven is by the uh, first resurrection. All right, now the interesting thing, all the Jews during the time of Christ would have understood what they were talking about when they mentioned the resurrection. Look at John chapter 6. I'll just show you a few of them. I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving many, many out, but here are the few that I thought of right away. John chapter 6, verse 44. says this, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, in a nutshell, I'm going to tell you what I think it means to, for the Holy Spirit to draw people unto Him. When we preach the Bible, the Holy Spirit draws men unto Him. Amen. Okay, the Bible makes it clear, if you don't, without the preaching of the Gospel, right, people aren't going to hear. And if they don't hear, they're not going to believe. But when they hear the Gospel, that allows the Holy Spirit to begin to prick them. Right, and I remember whenever he asked, uh, when when the Lord asked Paul on the road to Damascus, "Why do you kick against the pricks?" Right, somehow he had heard, probably looking Stephen in the face, and Stephen's preaching the gospel to him. He had heard that, and he had an opportunity. Now I've got to decide what to do with what I just learned, what I just heard. You know, Brother Justin was talking about that atheist guy that he talked to, and he let him give him the whole gospel. And at the end, he he had that choice: do you believe it or not believe it? All I can hope is that the Holy Spirit was saying, yes, you know this is true. But unfortunately, that means he said no, and that puts him in a really bad point at this, at this time. Another guy uh, we talked to yesterday uh, was a guy that was a homeless guy. And he came up to uh, Brother Nick and I, he was asking for money. And, I, and, and we were talking, no, I don't have anything. And, and, uh, and I was thinking, this thought came to me, you know, he doesn't mind free gifts, right? He's, he's wanting a free gift right now. I wonder if he'll receive a free gift of salvation. And as I started giving him the gospel, he's quoting verses with me. And I'm like, man, you must have grew up in church. You know a lot of these verses. He said, well, yeah, when I was in prison, I totally gave myself to that. And I memorized the Bible. And I, and, and I, and I you know, was trying to come to the faith. And I don't remember how he said it, but he's reading the Bible and studying all that stuff. And then he said, but now I just don't believe it. And I'm thinking, man, that's terrible. I mean, you get to this point where you, you've come super close, right? You got a taste of it and you're getting, and the Bible talks about that in, in Hebrews 10, you know, and, and in Hebrews 6, even I think it mentions that. And so he got to this point where he understands the gospel and then he rejected it to the point where I was trying to make it real simple. Well, let me just explain to you that it's a gift. It's a free gift that you just receive, whatever. And it got about halfway through and he's like, all right, man, well, I got to go. And I'm thinking, oh, you'll take, Anything free that I could possibly give you right now. A lighter? He wanted a lighter. You'll take any of these things, but you won't take the free gift of salvation? How silly, how foolish, and how, how weird, you know, that you would, you would reject eternal salvation. But anyway, uh, uh, where was I? <laughs> okay, so in that day, uh, the people would have known that about this resurrection, okay? Look at John uh, 6, 44. Did we already read that? I got off on my... Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, so he said, uh, he said, I will draw him. That's what I did. So he will draw them, and then the Spirit does. He's active today, drawing men unto him. All right, I'm not talking about Calvinism. I'm talking about by the preaching of God, the Holy Spirit pricks men, draws them unto him. And, he's, and, and, and if he does that and someone receives him, he says, and I will raise him up in the last day. 
right? Sealed until the day of redemption, right? And so, uh, and so that's, a, that's a, a blessed thought. Jesus said it right there. Look at chapter 11 now. You're in John chapter 11. And verse 24. Or let's back up a little bit. Uh, you know, Martha just lost her brother Lazarus, and Jesus now showed, and he's saying, Hey, I know that you could have, uh, you could have, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. Verse 23 Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise in the resurrection. You see, it wasn't a mystery. It wasn't a secret even to them, really. They knew there was a resurrection. They didn't know all the details. But look, they've been talking about this since the time of Enoch, about the last days and the resurrection of the dead. So don't let anybody tell you like, uh, oh, no, this resurrection thing, this was a, you know, the going into the millennium and all that. This was just like this, this uh, plan B. <laughs> Jesus did, didn't usher in the kingdom like they thought he was going to, but, you know, but one day he will. No, this was something that was always taught. It wasn't a secret. Jesus said unto, Mary, unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou, believeth thou this? And she said, Yea, Lord. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Martha was a saved woman <laughs> right there. Uh, okay, so uh, Martha mentions the last day. Jesus mentioned the last day. Uh, you ever heard about the Sadducees? Look at Matthew 22. All right, it's a corny joke. Maybe you all heard it, but one of the corny preacher jokes they taught you in Bible college, was the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> da -dum okay. <clears throat> but it's an easy way to remember what the difference is between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I guess. Matthew 22. Look at verse 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, in case you didn't believe my corny joke, and asked him, saying, Master... Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, <laughs> it's always whenever somebody wants to just like uh, stump you, they always start asking this ridiculous off the wall stuff, right? And so he says, now, there were with us seven brethren. And the first, when he was, had married a wife deceased and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. The last of all, the woman died also. Uh, and last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Anyway, he's going on to a different, kind of a different message right there, but I kept reading because I love that passage so much. So we understand that there is going to be a resurrection. And, and following this resurrection... We might not know the exact time period, but following this resurrection, there's a thousand-year reign of Christ. We saw that Enoch himself prophesied that, and, uh, and all these about the Lord coming back, right? And so we read Revelation, and we understand when the Lord comes back, what does he do? He pours out his wrath, right? And it's interesting, Revelation 4, Revelation 14, when you read about that 144,000, what follows that is where you see multitudes of people in heaven, Right. And so here's what I'm submitting to you. Uh, this is this is my understanding of the Bible that I, the, 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 what I come to in reading of the Bible is that the Lord comes back. And when he comes back, he pours out his wrath upon the people and all the believers, when he comes back, and pours his wrath on the people are in heaven. You say, yeah, that's what I was taught. He comes back seven year tribulation and all that. No, no, I didn't say that. I said he comes back and he pours out his wrath. All right. 
Now, if you read everything up before that, I don't care where you go in the Bible when it deals with prophecy. If you're reading the events that happened before he comes and pours out his wrath, uh, you don't find uh, anywhere where it talks about, number one, a seven-year tribulation. What you do find is that uh, we shouldn't be surprised that we're going through tribulation. You do see where the Bible talks about being persecuted and how they're going to turn you over to the authorities and they're going to turn, uh, uh, they're going to turn on you and, and all the men uh, are going to uh, uh, persecute you. And, and you hear all these kinds of things. And, and when you read Jesus' words, Matthew 24, and he's talking about uh, you have to endure all this. And those who endure to the end will be saved. And all these prophecies come together. He says, when you, when you see all these things come to pass, look up, your redemption draw nigh, right? So, so all these things are going to come to pass. There's going to be wars, uh, some kind of a, like a world war. There's going to be the persecution of the saints, the rise of the Antichrist, all those things. Then the Lord comes back. And when the Lord comes back, he brings tens of thousands of people with him and an army. And you say, where are these tens of thousands of people coming from? Well, he redeemed them from the earth. Right? They were raised up in their resurrection. Okay, so that brings me to my second point. Number one, most people will die this way. I mean, we'll get to heaven they're bodily. Okay, we all get to heaven spiritually the same way. Uh, in fact, as soon as you die, if you're saved, your spirit's in heaven with God. I'm not going to take time to, uh, to prove that, but that's the case. Okay, so, uh, so uh, you die and, and bodily you wait for the resurrection where you receive glorified body in the resurrection. That's proven in Scripture. The second way our bodies will get there is in the rapture. In the rapture. I do believe in a rapture. I do believe. Someone say, well, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. You ever heard anybody say that? Which is true. It's not in the English Bible because it's not an English word. It's a Latin word, and it's in the Latin Bible. But here's what it means. It means to be caught up. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. I know we're going a little deep, but I know the, the crowd I'm preaching to, and I know you can handle it. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And look at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Those are the, that's the first group we talked about. That ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto, uh, unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. All right, that's the group we already talked about. Now, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words, okay? All the words that he just said, number one, if you preach a funeral, you're probably going to read this because it says comfort one another with these words and you're going to say, hey, I know you're sorrowing for those that are, that are dead, uh, but if you know your loved one was saved, they're a believer, you don't have to sorrow like the world sorrows. You can have hope that one day in the resurrection they're going to be raised again. But then he says, not only that, but those who make it unto that rapture, those who make it to that time, will be caught up together with them in the air. So you got some folks coming up out of the grave, and you got other people just walking around, and all of a sudden they're going up too. right? And so that's what we understand about uh, this, this rapture. And, uh, and, and the word there, caught up, is where we get the word rapture. Like I said, it's a Latin word. Because really in English it sounds pretty funny to say the great catch-up, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a lot easier. The rapture sounds better, I guess. I don't know. So, but that's what it means to be caught up, right? And we're all going to be caught up. Another word would be translated, right? Or to be like, uh, uh, like Enoch was. He was translated, all right? And this is, where, this is what we're talking about in this picture. He was translated. He just walked with God, and then all of a sudden he was not. Who else... Who else uh, went to be with the Lord that way? Anybody? Elijah. 
Same thing. Elijah's standing there, and Elisha's watching him. He had kind of already predicted that this was going to happen. And he goes up in a chariot of fire. He's there, and then boom, he's gone. Right? And then, uh, and then one day, obviously, like I said, we will uh, do the same if we're, if we're here, you know, that, that long. Uh, either way, we still have hope because if we're dead and in the ground, he's going to raise us up. Again, spiritually, we're already there, but that's another subject. All right, and then, uh, and then if we make it to the end, we're going to be saved from the wrath that's to come because when Jesus comes back to pour out his wrath, Christians aren't children of wrath, so they'll be gone, right? In the rapture and in the resurrection, we'll go stand before uh, God and, and, uh, and we'll receive rewards and how, whatever happens between that time period be, be, while Jesus is pouring out his wrath, God's pouring out his wrath, the angels are, I guess, uh, on the world. I guess we're going to have a really uh, condensed, because I think that time's about three and a half years that we're in heaven. That's a condensed uh, uh, Bible training program right there. <laughs> three and a half years, man. You're going to learn what you're going to do in the kingdom, and you're going to get your rewards and, and your assignments and all that kind of stuff. And then we're going to come back with him uh, to whenever he sets up the millennial, millennial kingdom, okay? And then the third way that somebody gets there to stand before God in heaven is through that second resurrection. We already mentioned that. Let's go back to Revelation 20. On the second resurrection, you don't want to be part of that one. I actually, I, I wasn't supposed to read this the first time, but I'm going to read it again. <laughs> Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book of life, according to the works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, I don't know how much Enoch knew or he understood. Uh, I think that he obviously had some kind of revelation given to him about the world's going to get wicked and then God's going to come back. And I taught this in, uh, in Iola when we are going through Ezekiel, talking about Ezekiel, how oftentimes there are actually multiple uh, fulfillments of prophecy. So there will be some Old Testament Bible prophecy, and you read that, and it kind of, the people that living during that time were looking at that prophecy like, hey, any minute, man, this is going to happen, you know. And, and, and there was a some, somewhat of an immediate looking, for, immediate looking for a fulfillment. And then some, of the, some prophecies in the Bible, they were fulfilled, you know, years later, in a way, right? But ultimately, we read in Revelation to find out all of it will be fulfilled in the very end. And so you do have some kind of interesting uh, uh, fulf fulfillments of prophecy, but I guarantee that God is, is showing us from Enoch, he's saying, hey, the Lord's coming back with 10,000s of his saints with him. I think you, you line that up with Revelation and you can see what, he, see what he's talking about. But there's only one way spiritually to be uh, transported unto God. Obviously, spiritually, there's only one way. That is by trusting the Lord uh, and, and calling on the Savior. But there's, there are these different ways to get to heaven bodily, okay? Go back to Jude again. So knowing that, we already said you comfort one another with these words, those who are dead, uh, but you know they're saved. They'll be in heaven again. I mean, you'll see them again in heaven. That's what I meant to say. In Jude 17, it's kind of you see this idea of, okay, now what are we supposed to do? Waiting for that day to come. How are we supposed to live our lives? What are we supposed to do? Look at verse 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there shall be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having no, not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, here's what you're supposed to do, building up yourselves, one another is talking about, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, 
Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. See, Jesus died for his church. He died for those uh, who would accept him, believe on him. You know, this group that would stay together, that would grow after his ascension. And uh, we see they were saved, they were baptized, they began meeting together, they began uh, doing all they can to help and support one another and encourage one another. And as an army kind of going out into the world and trying to preach the gospel and bring others. And all those are is, that is the things that we are supposed to be doing as his church. And he says this, he says, build one another up. Here's what you're supposed to be doing, right? As you're waiting for that day, whether we die, what's the worst thing to happen? I know we were talking about, uh, you know, how some of these rough neighborhoods we've been going in. And, and the other day, you know, uh, Braden and, and Austin, I don't know if anybody hasn't heard this yet, but uh, Braden and Austin were knocking on the door and, and all of a sudden they heard, Ch-ch-ch-. and they're like, somebody behind this door has a gun. <laughs> right? And so we went back uh, to, you know, the neighborhood was, it was dangerous for different reasons. This is the one that we went to yesterday, but, uh, but not necessarily didn't feel threatened for your life. But we got to thinking about that. And I don't remember what I said, but I said something to one of the guys about somebody pulling out a gun. And I think it was Brother Justin. He said, what are they going to, what are they, what am I scared of? Going to heaven? <laughs> right? What do I have to fear? Like, why am I afraid to give my life for the Lord? I give my life for the Lord. The worst thing that could happen is, is I don't get to see the rapture. <laughs> worst thing that happens is I die. But you know what? I'm still going to heaven. And even in my, even my body, I'm still going to get a glorified body somehow. And uh, we won't use this message, this time of this message, to explain uh, some, my thoughts on on some of that. But here's what he said: Build one another up, pray. You know, he said, uh, uh, keep yourself in the love of God, and and he's just talking about living right and being holy and, and trying to please God. And really, what we're doing is kind of kind of building rewards for in that resurrection when we receive our rewards. You know, he's not talking about, hey, you're going to lose your salvation if you don't live for the Lord. He's saying when the Lord comes back to pour out his wrath on the world, he's also, we're going to go through a type of a judgment as well. Now, we're not going to lose our salvation, but there's a lot of works and things that we live for in this life that are just going to be burned up and not mean anything. And he's only going to reward us for those works and those labors that we did. So we want to live this short time that we have on life just getting rewards. He said, well, yeah, you guys always talk about going soul winning and, and uh, it's all about soul winning and getting rewards. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about rewards that you get in heaven for soul winning. After all, isn't that the most important thing? I could feed, I could have given that uh, homeless guy some money. I could have went and bought him a burger. And a lot of people in the world would have said, now that's Christianity right there. That's the most loving thing you could have done to somebody. No, it's not. If he rejects uh, Christ, he's going to hell. Most loving thing I could do is teach him the, the gospel, and, and, and hopefully he'll get saved, right? And so are we supposed to go soul winning? Well, what did he say in Jude? Some have compassion, making a difference. You know, there are those who've messed up. You know, they've messed up their life. They're in a hard spot, and we would, as Christians, want to show them compassion and love. You know, uh, we, had a, we had a girl come this morning, and... Uh, on the bus, we haven't seen her for a long time, but I got a phone call, and she wanted to come to church, her and a friend, and she came, and, and, uh, and I won't give all the details, but it was one of those situations where I had a hard time showing compassion. It's like everything out of her mouth is a lie. Uh, she was dressed, dressing awful. She was talking about, you know, inappropriate things, you know, somewhat, and, and I remember just getting so mad, like, I don't even want her to come. <laughs> I don't want her to come back and all that, and, uh, and, and look, there are two ways to approach people, Okay. There are those people who will respond by you saying, look, I love you. I'm having compassion. I'm having mercy. You know, I just really, they're, they're going to respond well to that. And you're, and you're tolerating a lot of things in their, you know, in their life, but ultimately because you're leading them to the Lord. But then there's a time where people aren't getting that. Everybody say, oh, well, you just got to love them. You just got to keep loving them. You just got to do that. Well, some people aren't getting that. Here's the weird thing, too, is if you say something about somebody's sin, a lot of times they'll say, Hey, well, I got a lot of friends who do those things, you know. 
I got a lot of friends who, who, who live like the world and they do all this and I'm trying to reach them. And when you preach hard against their sins, you're turning away and they don't want to come to the Lord. Have you ever heard anyone say that? You think, okay, well, how long have you been their friend? Oh, about 10, 15 years. Is your way working? <laughs> you know, is your way of love and compassion and just all? Some people, that doesn't work. Some people, there comes a time, I've tried to love you, I've tried to be compassionate, I've tried to explain the gospel to you, you're not going to get it. I need to be rough with you. I need to snatch you out of the fire, hating the garment spotted by the flesh. And so there are, there are two kind of approaches to soul winning. There's that loving, compassion, mercy. You know, we all ought to have some of that as Christians. We ought to have some compassion in our Do justly and love mercy, right? Micah 6, 8. And so uh, we, ought to, we ought to do that. But there are also some times where we have to pull somebody out of the fire. But man, we do that because... We do believe, we're not like the Sadducees, we do believe in the resurrection. We do believe there's going to be a rapture one day. We do believe Christ is coming back and He's going to give rewards to the saints. He's going to pour His wrath out in the world. We want to spare people from having to go through that judgment. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the truths of it. And I know we could say the same things every single week and, uh, and just hear the same things, be reminded of the same things, and truly... Uh, it's okay because that's, that's what we need to do, Lord. We need to, we need to be encouraged to live for you. We need to be encouraged to give our lives uh, for the work that you've called us to. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help uh, this group of folks. I thank you so much for their hard work and their, uh, their loyalty and their um, commitment to you, Lord. And I pray you'll help us to continue to, to, to grow for the right reasons and to grow uh, and to be strengthened and to set our roots, our roots down really deeply and and, uh, and be strong in our understanding of the Word of God and strong in our service for you. And we won't be shaken or moved uh, from, from where we take our stands. But Lord, most importantly, help us bear fruit. Help us see souls saved. And help us do what we can to save people from the fire. Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.